So we have with us Nupur Junjunwala today, who is a great resource for all of us. She is a parent, advocate for her teenage daughter, and has co-founded Changing, along with her dyslexic brother Kunal. Changing works on supporting individuals with neurodiversity from cradle to career. She is a lifelong advocate of building an equitable society and has extensive experience in working in government, UN agencies, civil society, private sector to achieve gender equality, financial and digital inclusion, education and disability rights. Nupur is also a board member at the Ashoka University in Delhi. So we welcome Nupur. A very warm welcome to you, and we are so happy to finally see you and address our uh, parents. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashmiji. Um, I'm so happy to be here, and I, I know a lot of you all, uh, all of you all are also parents. So I, before I start my presentation, I just wanted to share a little bit about our journey. Okay. So many, many moons ago, I came home after a long day at work and instead of being greeted by my jovial eight-year-old daughter, I was greeted by stark silence. A silence that resonates a sadness that hits your core. A sense of hopelessness and dis despair lingered in the air. Nitya was lost in a corner, invisible, buried in her desk. As I went near her, I could see she had been crying. She lifted her head up and overwhelmed with emotion, burst into tears she was trying so hard to control. Her entire body was trembling, swaying uncontrollably, and between those sobs, all I could hear was, Mommy, I'm scared. I'm stupid. I'm dumb. I don't deserve to go to school. I just don't deserve to go to school. As I hugged her tight, all I could think of was, how did my jovial, full of life child go from loving school to this? What had happened? This was my baby girl, the baby girl who had given me the courage to leave my abusive marriage, the reason I had survived the depths of hell. The baby girl who had given me the strength to travel across continents, give up the American dream and return to India of, after almost a decade. The baby girl whose smile gave me the power to restart our life. How had she become so helpless? What had happened? Where had I gone wrong? And what had I missed? This started our journey to discover that like my younger brother, Nitya was also dyslexic. A learning disability that impacts. She has a dis 35 million children in India most of who are not diagnosed and most of who are accused of being lazy, unintelligent, and are bullied by teachers who do, do not understand the, the ability, do not have the ability to see this invisible disability. So with the diagnosis in one hand and loads of information in the other, we once again picked ourselves up, wiped off our tears, brushed off our fear, held our head high and marched forward, surrounded by an army of supporters in which friends, family, teachers, classmates had enlisted, ready to conquer dyslexia. Fast forward a few years, and as an empowered parent advocate, just like I am speaking today, I was speaking at another parents' workshop that aimed to build awareness around the strengths and opportunity for children with dyslexia. You know, I was determined, I was standing tall, I had this mic, I was making this great presentation, I was pumped. 40 million self, 40% 40 of self-made millionaires are dyslexic. Dyslexia is known as the MIT disease. Don't lose hope, I said. I was on a roll, yeah. I was really, I believed what I that I was preaching to the choir. That all these parents were just scared like I had been many, many years ago. I was confident that it had, if they just had the information I now had, they would soon join our army of empowered dyslexia warriors. And then a mom stood up, looked me in the eye and said, stop weaving dreams for me. These stories and statistics look good only on slides. The hard truth is if my daughter isn't intelligent enough to pass a basic math exam, how will she clear the competitive entrance exam to become an architect? And that's when it hit me, my bubble of hope burst. In all our struggles, never once had we believed that Nitya was not smart enough. Never once did that thought cross our mind that she didn't have what it takes to succeed. All we ever focused on was what was needed to ensure that she succeeds. To me, that was the universal truth, the holy grail. But here in front of me was a mother who was filled with a sense of shame and belief that a child didn't have what it takes to succeed. In this moment, I realized that just like children need support to cope with their learning disabilities, parents also need support to learn how to advocate for them. Because if parents can't, aren't ready to advocate for their child, what chance does a child have? 
and this is when the seeds of my foundation changing were sown with a dream that no parent should ever feel shame and hopelessness about their child's learning disability like this mother who was standing in front of me and you know and i believe that a lot of us in this group have gone through this my journey as a parent of a child with dyslexia has often been filled with pain anxiety and loneliness it has been filled with nights consoling my child that has struggles with reading writing spelling so will get better it has been filled with days where i had to stand ago alone and shield her from the hate and judgment by those thrown at her uh, by ignorant people around her as a parent my role has shifted from being just a caregiver to becoming an advocate and i've had to educate myself of my child's rights and how best to support her i've always i have also had to teach myself how to become the voice that must speak up so that society doesn't silence my child's voice doesn't crush her right to learn and to thrive but my story is not unique my story is shared by million other parents just like you and me across the world so this is really the story of how i got into this space and how we all why we all really need to work together and learn and educate ourselves constantly to advocate for our children with this i'm going to segue into a little presentation that i have on how we can become better advocates this is really a story about how my child can do it too here are a few examples of how it started for them shashank has adhd and she's on the spectrum i've masked the names so that you know for the privacy of the child he in india did poorly academically he couldn't go anywhere alone and his mom was his 27 by 7 or 24 by 7 caretaker who handled him he was often aggressive sometimes abusive very very emotionally turmoiled um relationship dipti had sld has sld and adhd she was i am diagnosed she failed her board exam actually by one mark she had no support in school often called lazy and picked on so is years of trauma and self low self esteem and then kunal who's the co-founder of the foundation with me my brother he was diagnosed at age 11 he just about made passing grades and you know we come from a marwadi typical marwadi family so the idea was that he'll become a pun in some munimji's office because he just didn't have it but he was a computer whiz and that was not really often accepted and he was accused of cheating often when he did well so what are these guys doing today shashank is currently pursuing computer science in at university of vancouver in canada on a scholarship he traveled alone to vancouver during the pandemic um and it's amazing from delhi he went to male in maldives from there he went to abu dhabi from abu dhabi he went to toronto and from toronto he went to vancouver this is a journey he made completely alone because he was enabled dipti became a teach for india fellow where she was teaching in classrooms before that she graduated with psychology honors at franklin marshall college in pennsylvania it was actually at the university that she got diagnosed and was provided the accommodations she's now pursuing a double masters at new york university at tfi uh, she worked with students in mumbai and ensured that they all got tested for sld's kunal is why you know he graduated from rochester institute of technology with a computer science degree he has an executive mba from trium which is the number one a uh, program between uh, that has been set up by London School of Economics New York uh, University and Hecht in Paris his company employs over 500 people and is present over, over five countries uh, over four countries now this is a little bit about how kunal sort of spoke um, coped and i'm hoping that it will resonate with some of you all cheater in class and i'll tell you why because in math class for example the teacher would put up the sum on the table and you know i would work it out in my head and have the answer ready with me and you know when she would ask me or he would ask me to show the working i wouldn't have it right 
So they always assumed I copied it from my peer sitting next to me. And then the peer said, no, I got the wrong answer. So this guy has figured it out in some way or form. So, you know, you went through that a few times because our brains just think differently, you know, and, and we tend to understand what is being said before the other person is finished saying what they're saying. And that becomes very unnerving. I didn't know my ABCDs till the fifth grade, to be very honest. The only reason I could write my name was because there was another Kunal in my class. He wrote it, I memorized it, and I simply copied it. You know, it was as simple as that in, you know, in the younger classes. I would sit at the back, so by the time the class finished reading the chapter twice, I had memorized it. So I would just pick up on where the person dropped off and, you know, recite from my memory. My sister started a computer class in the eighth grade and I was in the fifth. And I got intrigued by the fact that, you know, she was typing something on this electronic device and it was doing something magical on the screen. And I picked up on that and I started sort of spending my breaks in the computer lab, bugging the, uh, you know, the teachers and the assistants to teach me what they were doing. By the time I hit my seventh grade, I was actually doing 10th grade level uh, programming and you know college pro uh, school projects and that's what became my go-to thing as an out for my lack of success in academia and and the school encouraged it my my friends encouraged it and and that's when you know I decided right on my eighth grade to get a full-time job So here's Nitya and I told you a little bit about her earlier and this was her when I came home that night. She was trembling. It's ingrained in my eyes, you know, in my mind even today to see her like this. And what is she doing today, right? She's now 14. This is a little bit dated. Um, she has published a book. Uh, she's published a comic series called Purple Flame. She's become an advocate for equality as well. Uh, the Purple Flame comics that she's created uh, talk about how inclusion is important. It talks about the struggles of people with disabilities. Purple Flame herself is dyslexic. And then last year, she was actually selected uh, by UN Women um, as a Generation Equality Champion and featured. She was the youngest person featured in their annual report. So things shift. The idea of saying all this is that things shift. And it's our role to see how we can shift. And really it has, for me, there, there are 10 commandments that keep us all strong. And when I say us, I don't mean just my daughter and me. I, I mean the entire family, my, uh, you know, I remarried my husband, my, my other two children, the overall family, the school system, friends, society, all of them. So number one is acknowledging our strengths and weaknesses. No one is perfect. Not me, not you, disability, non-disability, it doesn't matter. But it's important to acknowledge that everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Somebody may be better organized. Somebody, you know, may not be able to spell. Somebody may be a bullockard and careless. Somebody may be very particular with listing. You know, my making lists and being critical. So somebody may be great at researching and, you know, finding out information but terrible at actually putting it all down together somebody may be great at putting it to, down together but cannot research so no one is perfect and we have to acknowledge that within everybody around us there's no hiding no shame we are proud of who you were you know when i we got the diagnosis officially uh when Nitya was in third grade i i was having a conversation with one of her classmates mums and she came up and told me she says don't worry Nupur. You know, there's, you don't have to tell anybody. There's this teacher in defense colony. I know usko bhej denge and Nitya is such a bright child. Sab ho and in my head, I was thinking like, dude, why, what is that to hide? Like, like, what am I uh, supposed to be ashamed of? Then the other, the third is build an ethic of hard work that we are giving our best without the measurements of success. Often what happens with parents is that a child studies, goes and does the test, fails it or does very, very badly. This could be something that the teacher also does, right? Says, you've not studied at all. If only you had studied better, you studied last moment, all of this nonsense, right? So it's better to not give an excuse that you're not going to put in the hard work. and But don't measure it in terms of the outcome. And that helps helps me with my daughter a lot. 
it gives her the freedom to say, okay, next time I will do better to set the benchmarks herself. Redefining success, never settling. So what does that mean to re redefine success? For us, it is that, okay, I studied really hard. I didn't fail. I did a little bit better than I did last time. Or I didn't do as well. Or maybe I was aiming that, you know, I didn't understand this at all. But I cracked it. I understood it. So it's about what success means to you and to your child. And But it's not an excuse to do poorly in life. Then open and honest communication. I think we all often get so tied up in the advocacy bit. We're fighting so many battles. We're fighting battles with school. We're fighting battles with managing your child. You're fighting, battling fight, battles at home, managing the in-laws, managing the cousins, managing the neighborhood auntie who has a comment about how your child may be. Uh, that we just forget to laugh. And we forget to communicate with each other. So we have an open communication policy uh, with Nitya where Nitya will turn around and say, Mama, I, I, you know what? I'm now too tired. I can't read. And I'll say, okay, I will read for you. Or I'm too tired. Can you type this answer out? And other times she'll be like, she'll do it herself. Now, of course, this is transitioning, right? So the, as a baby, she was a lot more honest. She's become a teenager and has started manipulating using dyslexia as a weapon right oh mama you know i have dyslexia my life is so stressful can you please help me uh -uh. not happening right but the fact is that we've been able to get this balance because we are able to joke about it it's it's something that you can't make make too serious in your life even though it's a serious connection if you do then the moment it becomes this people around you will accept it then including without excluding, I think this is the key. Often what we do is, you know, we fight so hard for our child's accommodations that we don't realize those accommodations may actually exclude them. And this works. This is more relevant, especially relevant for children who are hitting puberty and are in the teenage years. My child will not read aloud in class. Okay, teacher goes, child will not read aloud in class. Teacher goes, student one, student two, student three, skip child. Student five, student six, to student seven. The child is like, oh my God, I was not asked to read. I'm, am I that dumb? Am I not ever going to be allowed to read? Maybe I could have tried to read. Why can't they be patient with me? Can we create that system and say, okay, my child is now beginning to get confident to read. So maybe I will work with the teacher and say, can you tell me what part she has to read? So I will make her practice at home before. If there is a spelling test, child will not do spelling test, child will not do spelling test. You know, the child is twiddling thumbs, everybody else is doing spelling bee. Ha ha, tu to bevkuf hai, teko spelling nahi aati, itni simple thi. Can we say instead of a 10 list, she will do 5, but you know, her markings they will do on herself. So at least it builds confidence of progress and doesn't reinforce that I can't do. It could be use of technology, it could be asking for extended time, it could be about submissions of homework, whatever it is. I think we need to be cognizant of how we are being inclusive. The other in inclusive is that, you know, this missing of this PE class, library, all of those social activities. We got to make sure the child is not missing those uh, in that. The next is building those support systems. I think this is the most difficult, but if we crack it, it's the best advocating, educating those around us, friends, family, siblings, parents, teachers, ourselves. I have spent hours learning techniques, talking to people, uh, having this open communication with Nitya's teachers to see what's working for her, what's not. Uh, you know, I have a very supportive in-law system. They love Nitya to bits and they keep telling me, you have English more spelling, reading, reading, you like to put all this drama around it you know, and you have to learn to turn that around, right? And say that, no, I understand, of course, she's intelligent, but she still needs this help. Then we have this whole system of like, when padhai should happen? How do you build those relationships with siblings? We have this running joke in our family my my son is a nerd he like our fight with him is that you know please stop studying go enjoy yourself 
सो द रनिंग जोक इन द फैमिली जितने घंटे कार्तिक पढ़ता है उतने मिनट नित्या पढ़ती है बट पढ़ते दोनों है there no comparison right like so how do you sort of work through those how do you work it with your partner maybe who may not be i will i have always had a career i have never sat at home and done nothing and i apologize for that it doesn't mean that not done anything but i have never been a stay at home mom so i had to build these systems around me i had to have friends who would take care of nitya you know there's this whole push back that you don't give devices to children when they're younger and i used to be like boss my daughter is going to get a smartphone it is how she communicates with me the whatsapp messages is actually helping her reinforce language and spelling she learns better because of the digital books she will have the phone you know and she uses it for this but i also gave her classmates parents and mothers and friends this and my friends this authority that if she was abusing it if instead of doing homework and chatting she was sitting in a corner and actually watching youtube that was not done so you have to got to empower them right like and build this system where that and when you we are able to build it i think our children are able to advocate and normalize it as well they're not shying away for asking for the support we need and you know it really is our right but there's a way to do it i think if you're constantly fighting and saying this is my child's right apne medan baat nahi suna you are after my child's blood you don't care it won't work right you have to at the end of the day the teacher is also dealing with 40 kids i barely make it through the day with three kids of mine like the teacher has to deal with 40 children different arrangements right she may not be able to handle it maybe trying so maybe make that communication so our career together has had like this range of teachers we had this teacher who picked on nitya in a third grade with led to her diagnosis constantly and we had this little 8 years old who used to like stand up to this teacher and saying why are you picking on our friend right we had that nightmare of a teacher right so these little tots 8 year old would say stop it can you not see that she is trying hard enough why do you keep picking on her and then so this we had this nightmare teacher but we also had multiple teachers who you know sat in with nitya read with her opened the doors and said look if you ever feel sad feel this please come to me but i don't want you to be unhappy in school then as she grew older you know there we had this one teacher who was a nightmare like she taught nitya english for 3 years and every time i got an assignment back from that teacher it always said you can try harder work work on your spellings like this was a constant thing so at one point i got frustrated and i wrote to her and i said look asking nitya to work on her spellings is like asking a blind child to copy off your blackboard please stop it you've known her enough we've given you enough allowance please stop and you know that was very aggressive for a person like me but her class teacher was so supportive she said ma'am i no but i don't know why you keep coming to me and advocating it's high time that nitya comes to me directly she needs to be empowered to ask her right and that transition right as a parent to say oh my child is old enough does not need to be protected anymore ki kya hai is is a transition we need to make in our head and i'm making it now it's not easy but she's in the ninth and i'm sort of working on on that myself then is managing expectations and allowing a child to follow their passion this becomes very very crucial when we are looking at subject choices i want to become an architect maths to aati nahi bada architect architect banega i want to be a scientist physics mein zero marks aate hain how the hell will you become a scientist kabhi socha hai tumne so these kind of things are counterproductive the question is what are the pathways that we can create to follow that nitya is an avid ballet dancer she does ballet Six, for almost five days a week, she does three and a half hours of ballet every day. The other two, she does ballet two hours a day, uh, two hours in the day. Okay. Now, I am sure all of you here are thinking I'm crazy that I'm spending so much time in her ballet that boss, ये पढ़ाई कब करती है? ये dyslexic इसको already इतना time लगता है. How does how do you manage this, right? But my point is that when Nitya does that ballet. her body is so relaxed her mind is so relaxed she's got that kinesthetic energy of her thing she comes home she does dinner and her homework 
is done in a matter of one hour. Same day when you don't do ballet, that same homework will take me more than two, three, sometimes a whole day to do. And it's damn frustrating. And then that notion, right? So, Mama, now I'm in the ninth standard. I will have board exams. So, you'll cut out my ballet. I said, what for? I said, not happening. But we have to figure out how you're going to do the help. So, the, my point is that are you allowing your child to follow their balance, passion? Do you have value for their passion? Is it becoming just another game, right? Like, how do you enable that? And then finally, it's take one day at a time. Please. I often used to get trapped. Oh no, abhi to third standard hai, fir fifth mein jayegi, fir board hoga, board ke baad college ka admission kaise hoega, college ka admission hoga, to usko akele rehna padega. If she has to stay alone, then how will she manage? And it used to drive me psychotic. No two days are the same. One day things will work, the other day it won't. Some days won't work. You say, oh no, kal bhi nahi chala, abhi bhi nahi, meri life hi aisi hai. So like, if we can start compartmentalizing, today was today. It was not today because it was like this yesterday also and it is not like this because the future will also be. Yeah, I think that is very yeah. sort of critical. And the last is nothing is impossible. We just need to figure out how to get it done. We have many people around us, both who are extremely successful and who are making a good life about how to sort of succeed. But I think it's possible. I think we're living it. My brother is a great example of, I've seen how it happens and how things shift. So I'm hoping that for all of us, this might help. So that's me. Those are my contacts for anybody who might want to reach out. Thank you, Nupur. That was such a wonderful presentation. Very, like it was from your heart and we could actually see the anguish that you have gone through which most of us have also gone through. Thanks for sharing all your, your story and all of us could resonate through what you were saying and you just put it out so articulately. The stories of the three children that you said and Kunal are so inspiring. We have heard so many stories, but yes, these are real people that you have met and you have seen how they have grown out of their difficulties. And uh, your whole talk, your presentation is sort of a reminder to all, uh, to those of us members of this group of gold parents who have become a bit callous or complacent so that we can gather our acts together now. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions from our uh, audience? Dear Nupur, how does your daughter deal with peer pressure is a question from Bamshi Priya. So she has a great peer group and they've sort of figured out how to help each other. She actually, two of her best friends are gifted kids. They're on the genius panel um, and very, very high. So she has learned an advocate where, um, you know, they have found a balance of each other's strengths. So they help her with her spellings and like vocabulary and she helps them organize. So um, in fact, the joke is that... Um, you know, in the ninth grade, we the school split into IGCSE and CBSE. Nitya continues in CBSE and her friends have gone into IGCSE. And uh, these two girls were like, oh my God, Nitya, you won't be in our class now. Who's going to remind us? Where is the take your pencil box? Where is your water bottle? Here is your notebook. You forgot <laughs> to pack your bag. You know, so because Nitya is very meticulous in her lists. My point is that this is how these kids have made balance, right? They figure out ki she is good at something and they are good at something and they sort of supplement each other. In At home, when it comes to grades and rankings, I am very, very strong about my language that ranks and grades don't matter. It is about your work ethic that you're creating. Are you hardworking? Are you trying to take a shortcut? You know, are you building that? Can you tell me that I did my best? If you tell me you've done my best, that is enough for me. It's, I don't need to hear, oh, mama, maybe if I had done a little bit more, then bajegi. Like, then you are like dead. When the moment you say, Ki, oh, I wish I had done a little bit more, does not. Then it is, homework has to be submitted. It has to be submitted on that day. This I forgot business does not work. Why does it not work? Because we have given you the tools, right? You have to write in your notebook. You have an online system. You have 10 friends. You are on the group. 
if you have not written homework that day please ask your friend to tell you if you have not asked your friend all your teachers know please message your teachers harass me as last resort so i'll ask the parents but i forgot does not work so that's how we sort of navigate our days thank you Narayanan, would you like to speak something? Uh, actually, I enjoyed the program. Since I'm working with my children, I can understand what is the uh, face the parents as well as the ch child is going on. And uh, really, it is uh, very helpful from your presentation. I learned a lot of things which I can utilize in with my children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Noshin, please go ahead. Noshin, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, um, Rashmi and uh, Mirdula and uh, hi, Nupur. My hugs to you. And I could still feel, uh, you know, when, when you were speaking, you were almost in tears and, you know, and, uh, and it resonated in, uh, in me also and the rest of the parents as well. Uh, my question to you is, uh, what is your take on homeschooling? Because, uh, yes, regular schooling, um does take uh, does do a lot of toll on the kids and also on the parents and some always we are trying to say where to fit in our child where to fit in our child and and just like even though we are aware of the dis of, of our child's dyslexic advantage but still somewhere we are trying to fit there you know always where do we get grades or even when we talk about success of a dyslexic child we are also always trying to see like now they are doing such a high degree. Now they are doing degree in this university. So again, trying to always trying to compare and see like like any other a neurotypical child, right? If you see a neurotypical child going to the uh, prestigious university, doing a prestigious degree, and we are trying to equate the success of our child also when they achieve at that place right so we are trying to always try to fit there where the neurotypical child is absolutely so, Noshin, I, I so is that right is my first one question sorry and the second question is how about what is your take on homeschooling so i have two answers i think comparing your child whether neurotypical or not typical is probably never a good idea no, i think just everybody for has for comparison I, I use that word yeah but setting expectations also of a child's success journey or what they can, cannot do based on the criteria of others is probably never a good thing for you or for anybody else. I think it's important to sort of work through the things that the child is good at and is working towards and helping them without the comparison. So I come from a family of like this, so dyslexia runs in one side of the family. The other side of the family is super geniuses. They're all toppers, have always been CBSC, uh, their state boards, colleges, professional degrees, like double, triple, triple, whatever, right? And then there was their brother. And then my brother came and then he was expected to be a pun. But the point is that he found his passion in computers. And when he found his passion in computers, we encouraged it, right? My mom played a big role in encouraging it. And my dad also, like I'm talking about early 90s, who had the money to have a desktop at home. But seeing my brother's eyes light up, right? Like he went nuts when he was in front of a computer. You did everything. And my father invested in that money because he said, Chalo, kuch nahi kar sakta, ye kar lega. And I think that is important in the sense that you got to figure out what your child is good at. The decision of homeschooling or not is, I think, a very personal one. It would never have worked for me. Up until now, I was not exposed to a lot of people who were homeschooled. Um, I almost always find it that children who are homeschooled are isolated, uh, both socially, which actually further may impact their social like mental and social well-being because they're often very friendly our, our kids so if you can manage that and balance it and have the way to do it but 
manage it i think that's a great decision in fact just the other day last week i met an individual what an interesting trajectory she had she was home schooled till 9th grade 9th grade she went to a dps in lucknow did a 9 10th 11 12th there then went to nift bangalore after which she became a teach for india fellow after which she has worked for the gambhir you know the gambhir um, foundation gautam gambhir foundation and with genpact so she has also transitioned into a formal sort of a more structured traditional life cycle life form even though she was home schooled i think it's figuring out where your child will best succeed the other is also be aware that children actually flourish in universities by the time their learning environment even without accommodations often do they really really well in spite of how they've struggled in school because suddenly they're studying things on their own so i noshin i don't think there's a right and wrong answer it's really what's best for your kid thank you thank you nupur thank you see i don't think there are any more questions but i'd like to add one more piece of gyan and i apologize for this but um technology it's a big savior but technology doesn't need to be the complicated high invested technology it could be even the smallest of things i have used alarm alarm systems in phones to help my child manage time where i've said she does just does not understand the concept of 2 minutes and 5 minutes so we said that homework will take 30 minutes this is we are starting at 5 o'clock at 5:30 the alarm will ring this is 30 minutes that you get and reinforce it so find fun ways of how you can use everyday technology whether it's a calculator whether it's an alarm clock whether it's a word processor an audio book when you look at television turn on your closed captionings if you are not already doing it even in videos default it works great when they trace the words to reinforce reading so she watches tvs and hours of youtube i allow it listens to music all the time but my deal is you have to have closed captioning on so things like that really do help now there is another question uh, nupur um this is from lata she has two questions one is the child loses interest quickly and gets moody how to handle this and the second is he has not picked up any hobby he's 10 years old does he still have time to pick up his hobby or should i as a parent get involved so the first is figure out why he is losing interest quickly maybe you are extending the time for too much or maybe he is sort of a uh, losing interest when it's getting complicated when it's getting difficult it might he may be losing interest because he doesn't know how to step that bridge that next step of complexity of whatever task he is doing or it may be that it's taking too much of his time so nitya started ballet when she was young she did 30 minutes a day uh, once a week and today that was in grade 1 today she's in grade 9 doing 5 days 3 hours a week 3 hours per day and 2 days a week 2 hours a day so i think you need to figure out and in this we've always had these times when she really wants to jump those difficult periods and how to handle that so that's how i think you would talk about getting moody uh, also find ways to help him with his moodiness what helps get him back is he kinesthetic where he requires to go run around is he someone who's auditory listen needs to listen to music what cuts that wire you know that circuit and resets it that's that's one he is not picked up a hobby 10 years does he have time to pick up i think you can pick up hobbies any time in your life um if you if he hasn't picked up something maybe you can get involved to expose him to different ideas uh, a child doesn't necessarily need to have one hobby you can do multiple things painting drawing computers lego puzzles i don't know watching television whatever it is if he likes watching tv you can try and see what kind of content he watches yeah. you know that also often helps um documentary short videos talks about people yeah. life experiences news sometimes helps also so i hope that answers your question lata so i have a question nupur uh, since you have worked in uh, several states uh, in the field of dyslexia through your uh, um, foundation changing um, how um, how 
good is the number of special educators available uh, in different states? I think there is a real problem with availability of special educators. I think it's a big, big challenge. Uh, I think there is also a system of fraudulent uh, special educators. We see a lot of those happening where they claim to be educators, but really um, they aren't as qualified. We have a lot of people who've made it a money business where they're giving wrong diagnosis to force children and parents to take those uh, oh their coursework so for example i had a parent that i that i you know that we supported um very affluent family in south delhi and uh, got a diagnosis from one of these so called experts who put the child at low iq high sld um, zero spatial reasoning, zero ability to plan and told them that you must do this crash course and these interventions which are very complicated otherwise your child will fail out of school. Like these parents like called panicked and when we got them formal testing done at the local hospital, average IQ, the IQ raised basically from 65 to 120, 110. That's how different the numbers for IQ was. This was a child that was playing strategic Minecraft games. Um, so spatial reasoning came out and has dyslexia, which was okay. Uh, Change school has is flourishing. So uh, I think there is a problem with special educator availability, but I don't think there's a problem of dearth of resources that we as parents and other teach regular teachers can use. I think more we empower our regular teachers to be able to handle this in their classroom helps. I think reinforcing educational concepts using multitude of multi-sensory sort of things at home also helps. Um, the other example I would like to give is Nitya did the OG program with a special educator, but what really helped her is that her English tuition teacher set up a system called Book Pals, where she had five to six children and they, the kids picked which book they would read that month. And they went through that book of reading. And then uh, they also uh, did reading strategies and writing strategies around those the story that they were reading. And Nithya's reading level has gone up, I think, four times because of that. Uh, she's today studying Shakespeare. She's doing Julius Caesar. Last year, she did Merchant of Venice. So it was not an intervention program in the sense of a formal special educator it was an English teacher who she and me sat and figured out how, what would help this child. And can I tell you, like, I, I know I'm boasting about Nitya, but she is an average kid. There is no genius. Like she's not one of those very highly motivated children. She's just like yours and my, any neighborhood kid. Uh, but it's just, we have been able to crack what works for her and what what does it? Yeah, that's really very important. And the parent has to be involved and constantly observant of the child to get to know what works because uh, there are different things that will work with different kids, with different dyslexics. Um, I have a question for you, Nupur. I'm actually, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the queue, but I just can't help myself. So uh, I just want to know, because I personally believe that not all children uh, require or it will benefit you know going through the uh, what is that called uh, not not autonomium but uh, that side that style of learning right yeah the, the phonics uh, what is it called phonics oh my god i keep forgetting yeah. so, so not yeah. all children uh, see not all dyslexics require it yeah. but some do and some don't and there are some for some who it just doesn't work at all work at all yes and i think you know, just give your take on that because as parents, we also need to understand that there's no one size fits all, right? Ab absolutely, Mridula. I think you you hit the nail on your head, on the head because the thing is, um, for example, Nithya does very badly with phonic breakup and my brother cannot figure out, he's now almost 40 and he still cannot figure out, eh, eh, oh, just does not get it. But he's an avid reader and he has followed the concept of tracing. So that methodology is really that you read 
and when the child is reading somebody is reading out loud so it could be a human or it could be an audio book where you actually the child is tracing the words and the more they trace the word is like another image or a picture for them so they're not actually recognizing a b c or a and d for and individually they're recognizing the word and in the context of it so there that strategy really helps with in the sense of uh you know contextualizing the word meaning and then them picking up that mean word as an image and the more they see it the more it gets reinforced and there's that whole technique there which the og doesn't work right i think you got to figure out the mix of what works nithya hates audio books she finds that robotic voice very very irritating but she likes the immersive reader which does the tracking you know that right like the karaoke sort of thing so she, that works for her uh she also likes listening to audio books as like you know the activated play ones without following so i think you got to just sort of i think you should figure, figure it out for your own child for right your child yeah. you got to and you need to figure out what type of learner your child is like i am a person who needs to sit straight you know back straight all of this nitya is a dancer when she learns she does this she'll do this at one point her head was her hand leg was above her hand and that's how head when she was learning spellings and it was driving me crazy but she learned the spelling yeah that it worked for her and i have i have learned over the last 14 years of being her mother that boss because for me this is a I, concern because most special educators go by a certain system and then it is phonics phonics have to be done and i'm i'm i don't contend that it works for many children but it also does not work for many children i think you have to special educators and parents Absolutely. also have to be aware of that and murla i think it is really about figuring out who is what type of learning works for your child and then finding the teacher who can provide that training Correct. it could be you it could be your it could be another teacher it could be a general educator it could be a program that does not exist and you learn from it online right it's about how you find find that solution for your child don't get trapped into this thing ki all dyslexics og program karo yahi hoga right you know all dyslexics home schooled nios wohi hoga all children must do and cbse does not do cbse will fail in life matlab there is no sort of fixed pathway for anybody flip it and think about it from a typical child does every child learn rote learning some children ex So you know, so why are we making this thing about exception of for our typical neurotypical kids, atypical kids? Right. Thank you. That that's the thing because I want parents to be aware and and constantly question what works for my child because for my child it didn't work. Phonics was a. Yeah, absolutely. Because she she doesn't read the entire word. She just reads the beginning and the ending, and, and then the end. That's how they pick Correct. it up, right? And then you figure and out what works. and then with the also that things change through the life cycle exactly so what's working when they're younger suddenly they'll hit 10 and you'll be like what is this and then they're 13 and they're teenagers and so uncool like what are you doing to me so right. we have to also be cognizant of that change that is happening in their personality and also ultimately follow the child you know that's very important yeah okay i will that's not the core of everything we do there are more questions so rashmi are you yeah. reading them out i'll i'll mute myself Yeah, I don't think there is anything after that. So there's one question there's about one. NIOS. There is one. My son is. Oh yeah. Hang on, hang on. There is one more. That's guy. My three. son is guy three. My son is dyslexic. Did his plus two in NIOS. He got through five papers. Didn't pass maths and physics. He's uh, aspiring for architecture. He fails the el- eligibility criteria. Is there any concession for such children if he gets a PWD certificate? um did he get his uh, for maths and physics did he get accommodations gayatri um while he, the nios paper um um like um, um he didn't have any accommodation for maths and physics in 10th standard and 11th 12th he did it uh, in the nios then i didn't uh, get any uh, accommodation because he didn't get a certificate for this SLD. So I just uh, he wrote it as a regular student. So I think if you get, sorry, 
somebody was saying if maybe get him the accommodations and see if he parts the maths and physics also see how he can learn physics is physics required for architectural yes maths and physics is required no. maths and physics required. but uh, yeah put together it should be aggregate should be more than 50 so that that's what we are trying to so i was wondering if i uh, if at all i get a pw certificate is there any uh, leniency in that uh, percentage that he should get it was my concern I have to get back to you. I'm not very familiar with this. My only thing is, I don't know if you can do maths and physics again. I, I don't know if there are repeat papers in NIOS. That no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying for an improvement exam anyway. Let him do it again. Yeah, it's but when you do it at that point, please make sure he gets his accommodations while writing those exams. That's because not, he may have not. failed okay. because he didn't have those accommodations. So then he may okay. actually make the marks required to meet the eligibility criteria. But all, okay. once he meets the eligibility criteria, when he gives the entrance exam, please use ah. the accommodations even at the entrance exams. That is very critical. Okay. 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 Because NEED, okay. JE, all of them have the same accommodations that CBSE provides as part of that. Okay. Often centers okay. don't know it, but you can ask. I have not okay. heard of exemptions of so, subjects. Uh, I was, okay, I was wondering where should we apply for such exemptions? If it is for entrance exams and all, if the if it, entrance uh, exam if too. Is, so you have to see Gayatri. You should see the thing is you should this should when he takes his yeah. twelfth exam itself he should have got his accommodations in place. So now I don't know if he because he's going to write it's a re-exam paper he's writing right? Am I right? No, it's re-exam. Yes, so yes, I don't yes, know yes, if he will. Yes. I don't know if they mm -hmm. will give it now. Excuse yeah, me. Because they were able to access this issue properly. That was the main concern. Whatever I was telling, they should be okay. But he was not okay that uh, only I could assess him better. But in the certificate, he could, they couldn't give that he's a SLD style. They said he, he's okay. But uh, in paper, I know he cannot do that. No, I think, you know, you will take this offline. We You you get okay. in touch with us. We'll take this offline okay. and we'll, we'll help you. Okay. Okay. Sir, sir, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. Any more questions? What are the accommodations or concessions of SLD child in universities abroad, like UK or Canada? Are you aware of it? Yeah. So UK, Canada, USA all have laws that children with learning disabilities must be supported. Uh, supported. Almost all of them have offices of learning support um, that continue to provide support for a child while they're in university. So that means you get concessions like typing answers, extended time for, uh, you know, extended time for submission. They also support you in managing your schedules, class selections, all of that, sensitizing professors in terms of how papers are corrected, no spelling, grammar mistakes, things like that. Um, in fact, in India, Ashoka University has a great center of learning support that is headed by Reena uh, Gupta, who's done that. Kriya has it as well, and other universities are beginning to start doing work. This is the law. Um, top to bottom, all universities will have it uh, internationally. And while you're doing admissions, it's great to let them know that you have this learning need. So your admissions will also be looked at from that perspective, especially when it comes to grades. Um, and when you're doing your SAT or, you know, your entrance tests for any of these universities, please take the accommodations that are available for all of them. All the information is available on the website. Uh, almost all universities on their website will say support for disabilities and learning disabilities. Please go and check that out. There's a question from Bhakshi Priya. Are there accommodations given for LD children in competitive exams as well? Any circular, etc. Can you please share? Yes, both NEET, JE, uh, C, I believe CUET, I can check on that. But I am confident that NEET and JE have circulars that actually uh, provide all the accommodations uh, in the same line as CBSE. Thank you so much. There is a uh, question from Nopur, uh, sorry, from Lata. 
Lata, yeah. Lata has asked, how about concessions in other boards like IGCSC, since we have a choice of subjects as well in that board? So IGCSE and IB both, all boards actually uh, have it. And I will share that comparison with you all, Mridula ji and uh, Rashmi ji, uh, that you all can maybe circulate with the, the community. But IGCSE, I just want you all to be a little bit careful. They allow you to drop the language, but then they don't give you the certificate. They give you a diploma instead. So when you do your subject choices, so if you don't take the second language bucket, then you don't get the the diploma, the certificate. You get the diploma, or vice versa. So whatever every all children get who've taken all the buckets, you get the lower version. Which is why we decided for Nithya not to do IGCSE, uh, primarily because um, you know then the the diploma is not recognized by colleges in India. Um, so to keep that option open, uh, but otherwise everybody gives accommodations. I think in IGCSE, you can get subject choices. You can get a question of uh, uh, MCQ based questions. You get a scribe, you get extra time, uh, depending on what your child uh, requires. It's not like a blanket thing. I think the teachers get involved in deciding what are the accommodations required. Sanjay. Hi, yes. Hi, yes, Sanjay. Yes, Andy. How are Tell you? Me. I'm fine, Andy. Okay, what is it that you want to tell us? Actually, what happened was my uh, first year of uh, diploma was finished in my college and my practical. What are you studying? So, what are you studying? What diploma I'm studying, are you doing? I'm studying mechatronics in TVS CPAT. It is in Managram. So okay. there I have finished my first year. So in that, they have some tests like, like practicals we had. So all the practicals were finished the day before yesterday. And then his parents uh, took a decision to pull him out of a CBSC school and put him in a matriculation school, a state board school. And then after he finished his 10th, they, he went into the, you know, via the diploma route. And believe me, this child actually is a genius. This child was doing, you know, I've seen him work fiddling with electronics. He would build his own. What he did, his father gave him a cycle. So he fi fixed a motor to that cycle and he started because uh, he wasn't, he didn't get a bike. So he was zooming around the streets of Chennai on this contraption that he has, he has made. A, ex a, a very, very smart chap. So congratulations, Sanjay. I hope you continue to do well. Even now, the cycle has become more uh, worse than a bike because it has gone more faster than a bike now. Now you have, to be, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Yeah, wear a helmet. And Sanjay gets an I cycle in the bike and have it Very patented. Nice. Patent it so we can buy it soon. But this is my exact point, right? Sanjay, congratulations. Thank you so much. Journeys change. Thank you. There is no one pathway to success. Today's failure is going to be tomorrow's success. Please don't get disheartened. Agar ye nahi hua, kuch aur hoga. Not all successful people in the world came through the traditional school system getting a degree, getting, you know, top schools, top marks. Most of the people who didn't do well academically are doing well professionally today. It is, once again, what I mentioned earlier is about creating the culture of working hard, of being honest, being passionate, and being driven by who we truly are instead of working towards what the world truly wants us to be. And that's when we crack that, we figure it out. So, Congratulations, Sanjay. You just made made my day and hope. Um, I do not want to dismiss the fact that there are days when there are you feel hopeless. You stay optimistic, but there are days when you feel hopeless. And it, we just have to overcome those and say, okay, today I'm hopeless, but tomorrow is going to be better. Yes, even I'll, do, I'll do that thing. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, Sanjay. And, and thank you, Nupur. It's been an excellent session. Rashmi, why don't you wrap it up with Nupur? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, parents. And uh, we today also, since the topic was about advocacy, we have had also, for the first time, we've had uh, uh, non-parents also participating, who are special educators, psychologists working in this field. And uh, thank you very much for your participation. Um, Nupur, it was really inspiring, your stories and uh, the work that you are doing. Um, full, full, 100% of uh, support 
from all of us from gold psg towards you and uh, we'll be really happy if you can come down to chennai and tamil nadu and uh, changing also works here with us soon soon definitely thank you for having me it's been a great session wonderful thank you thank thank you bye bye, -bye. You. and and the rest of the group we'll come back again next month with another guest and uh, and today's participation was pretty good thank you very much for spending your time on a saturday evening and if anybody wants to join our group uh, to join the gold parent support group rashmi has given the email id in the chat box it is gold psg 2020 at gmail.com i repeat gold psg 2020 at gmail.com so have a lovely weekend everybody